Hello everyone. What an absolute pleasure it is to be with you here um, at the last session of Words on the Waves. Uh, my name is Jess Scully. I also want to extend respect to the Dark and Jung people um, and to any Aboriginal people who are here present. I'm so delighted to be here and I'm, I've been so thrilled uh, to, to read and to dive into Wendy's world. Um, so I don't know how much of an intro I need to do, Wendy, of you. Um, I feel like we've got a lot of fans here in the room today. Uh, but uh, the reason this book is this long is because Wendy's bio is very, very extensive. Um, and, and there's a lot to it, a lot to read about. Um, Wendy McCarthy is a trailblazing feminist. She is uh, a, a board director. She is a person who has paved a path um, for, for my generation, for the next generations of women who, who seek um, to build a fairer world. Um, my, my background is that, that I'm, um, uh, I'm currently the Deputy Lord Mayor at the City of Sydney. I was elected in, in 2016 um, and I'm also an author. I wrote a book called Glimpses of Utopia, Real Ideas for a Fairer World. And I'm also really interested in building um, that fairer world that you've been building for some time now, Wendy. Um, so can, can we start, um, Wendy, by, by talking about your career, just, just as a, a, an overarching perspective. You've done so many things. How have you, how have you crafted uh, a career, that portfolio career of, of very many pursuits all coexisting, all those balls up in the air at the same time? Hmm, that's quite a hard one to start with. <laughs> but let me just preface um, my response while I'm thinking of it in the back of my brain. Um, by also acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we're meeting. And I'm liking, at the moment, adding to that the, that we must all keep encouraging the wonderful young First Nations women and men we are seeing emerge. It's one of the most exciting things of my time on Earth to see something that was not even able to be imagined as a child where I lived in country New South Wales. But coming back to your question, I didn't actually craft my career. Um, in fact, I'm sort of surprised I had one because I basically had jobs. <laughs> and that was, I think that was a design of the system of my time. When I was a student, when I, when I went to university, I had a teacher's college scholarship for four years. And it was a wonderful, wonderfully generous scholarship. And I was a very happy person at university. It, but on the end of it was five years that had to be financially returned if, um, if I broke the bond, I had a bond. Now, and, and my parents had to sign it. My father wouldn't sign it because he wouldn't sign anything about to do with the government. But my, my aunt, who was a ballroom dancer said, well, I've got no money, I'll sign it, so, you know, if it happens, <laughs> it'll be fine. And it was. But what I discovered, I, I left after three years and I got married. That was very, um, uh, uh, very socially approved of. And I thought it was fantastic because I didn't have to pay. It was my first bit of positive discrimination. You know, the <laughs> blokes had to pay if they broke it. I didn't. But of course, the penny dropped some years later when I realised, despite all my training and development, I was actually trained for a job, not a career. Women did not become principals. Women were held back by no maternity leave. And it took me a long time to think about it. And I've always I always remember that when people ask me that sort of question. It's not just about me crafting my career. It's me learning to work the system in order to find that my lot can actually benefit from whatever they've been offered or however they've succeeded. And they need to understand the system and realise these things are not just about one individual. So that's probably the most effective way I can answer that question. Mm. But, uh, you know, even though you didn't go into teaching with the the kind of grand aspiration of having a, a career. Uh, the, the, the mentors and the figures that you found through teaching had a profound influence on you and they're wonderful to read about in the book. Um, 
And I want to talk about this one moment in the staff room in 1963 when uh, a geography teacher opened your eyes to the fact that the fact that men and women in teaching weren't paid uh, the same wages and, and the fact that there was something actually wrong with that. There was a revelation and you're very generous in the book in the way that you bring us into that moment of realisation. What was it about that, that teacher's argument that revealed the unfairness of, of that to you? Well, it, we actually did have equal pay but it was still being talked about in the staff room mm. and she was a single woman who said uh, it was a big argument about how it should have happened a, lot, a long time earlier and even talk about, you know, how we should be compensated. The older women should be compensated for the fact that they had to leave their jobs and that many of the women in the staff room were really highly educated, wonderful women, but they had no responsibility. And I remember still saying then, well, you know, men have to keep the families. Why would you have equal pay? And I don't pretend that I was born thinking like Gloria Steinem or Betty Friedan or someone. I learned along the way by listening mostly to the older women in the staff room. And years later when I met some of those women, like Bella Absberg and Gloria Steinem and so on, I just think about the wisdom of the women in that staff room in 1963. And that particular woman did then a huge amount of work um, she actually went overseas to live because she was really, in, in a way, bored with the tedium of fighting. Mm. And she went to, and she did a lot of work in the um, the London Higher Education Authority, and I think that's where she still lives. But we are of our family when we're very young. We believe our family's values. We tell, you know, we spout those stories. We used to vote like our husbands. I hope nobody here does that anymore. Um, <laughs> Well, not, well, they can vote like them, but not because of them. But even in, in Karen Phelps' campaign for Wentworth, men would say to me, there's no need to give her, his wife, the voting card. We're voting for the Liberals. <laughs> I'll go, OK, and I'd slip it in behind you know, like this and say, you know, Karen, your doctor as well, vote for her. <laughs> but I, I, I just... It takes a long time to do that and... For me, I think a big part of my, this memoir is the personal is political. And when we learnt to, to understand as women that the things we cared about were not of great concern yeah. to our husbands or other men that we knew and some women we knew, we realised that we had to make them political issues in order to address the systemic nature of them. I think that, that was what was telling for me about that moment in the staff room is that you, you grow up in the culture that you're in and it takes uh, a great deal of confidence in your own uh, capacity, or your own logic, to be able to see through the <coughs> wallpaper that's yeah. all around you and past the assumptions of the way things are. Um, and you shared that moment with us and, and you had a number of those moments over your life and, and you also talk as a teacher about when you first saw uh, Faith Bandler speak and the profound impact, um, you know, she's a Torres Strait Islander woman who, you know, a real leader in, in uh, First Nations rights and the first time you saw her speak, the way that you discovered um, the alignment between First Nations justice and the social justice that you were beginning to, to care about. And, you know, at one level, the appalling th thought about that is that I'd been to New England University and Russell Ward was one of my teachers who... And, and he and his wife did an enormous amount of work in disadvantaged and vulnerable Aboriginal communities there. Why did he never take us as students there? And I'm not blaming him. And why were our eyes not open to that? It wasn't until this woman came in... It was around the referendum and started talking about the referendum was going to happen in, in a few years, that I actually understood. And maybe it had to be a woman-to-woman -woman thing, I'm not sure. But I also discovered that, that many of the women on the staff did have these, what they saw as private um, affiliations with what we'd now so describe as First Nation families. And that was mostly out of La Perouse. You talked before a bit about the 
the fact that the personal wasn't the political. It was there was this separation. Yeah. Uh, and there's a powerful moment in the book where you recount a speech uh, by Kate Jennings uh, at the time of the, uh, the the Vietnam protests, and this this kind of very disturbing realization that a lot of the things that mattered to women, you know, bodily autonomy, uh, how we take care of our families and kids, you know, how you take care of older people, all those things, they weren't seen as political. They weren't seen as part of the revolution. And that maybe we were just going to have to do this. Women are just going to have to do this for ourselves. Mm. Can you, you tell us about that <coughs> moment in history? Well, it was... Kate Jennings was a very um, exciting writer and... She, ju she just wasn't prepared to cop it and she just spoke at this group of um, post-football match at Sydney University. And, <clears throat> I mean, I wasn't there, but I read it that night. I don't even know how, that, how I got it so quickly, but I just knew then that we had to learn to make our issues political. And I think that was really... I mean, it, for me, last week's election result... I very strongly have the view that women won, women won the election for change. If it wasn't even just for um, the Labor Party or the independents, it was for change. Just voting against someone who had no respect for women and a system that had no respect yeah. for women. <laughs> and and I, I decided at the beginning of the year, my, my news resolution was... I'm not resting until Morrison's gone. <laughs> and my book just came out at the right time. And it, it gave me, in a sense, a platform. But also supporting, you know, I supported Allegra Spender. And, uh, well, I supported all the independents, you know. And that's one of the things. I'm a, I'm a person who's prospered out of f feminism. You know, I've, I, even though I've taken jobs at the daggy end at the beginning, they've become bigger jobs and bigger issues and so on. And... You know, here I am, and I'm not getting paid for talking about this, but here I am being able to talk to audiences about the sorts of things that have mattered to women and mattered to lives and about how to create change to be the, the kind of people we want to be. And I come back to one thing all the time, and that is that little red school book of Mao, <laughs> which, of course, two of my American friends pr proved I was a communist by even reading it, um, but where it said, women hold up half the sky. And I've believed in a 50-50 solution to most things ever since. And when people say to me, isn't it exciting? Like a very charming young woman said to me yesterday, oh, my God, women have got 30% of board positions. And I said, why would you settle for that? <laughs> why would you settle for 30% of the action when you could have 50 at least? And she said, I never thought about it like that. <laughs> and you don't want to def I don't want to deflate her, but if you're going to be satisfied with being so unequal, I mean, I really don't have time to think about it anymore. <laughs> well, look at the Senate now. Yeah. The Senate's 57% female now. Isn't that, a, isn't that extraordinary? I mean, no one was paying any attention to the Senate this election and women just snuck on yep. in there. Yes. <laughs> I think it'll be very interesting, to, too, to see what happens in state government elections in New South Wales and... and uh, Victoria, after this, you know, there'll be men hiding in corners worrying about <laughs> teal independence <laughs> or whatever cover they'll, they'll be. Maybe they'll be pink and red somewhere and it'll be vermilion, <laughs> but who knows? Well, I, you know, I was, as I was reading your book, I was struck by the similarities or the echoes from, from that moment in history of the, the 60s and the 70s and this moment now, you know, where, um, you know, in, in the 70s and early 70s, are uh, government that clearly had a women problem uh, and, I mean, they had no women yeah, anywhere in sight and that was clearly becoming a problem. Um, and then Morrison's government clearly having a women problem and, and women really coming uh, coming to, to shake things up and change things. Uh, Don't know, just, I do have yeah. to correct you there, sorry. Okay. It's what older women do sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> um, Don't worry, I get this a lot. <laughs> no, we had Senator Margaret Guilfoyle, who uh -huh. was an outstanding Liberal woman uh -huh. politician, we had Joan Child, who was a Labor Party politician. We did have some outstanding women. And when I think back at the strength of those women, and Beryl Beaurepaire, who was the, you know, the president of the Liberal Party, who proposed a 50-50 electoral solution with Jim Carlton in 1976, 
um, they were there. The tragic thing is how we get close to somewhere. It's like Gertrude Stein saying, you know, I, I, I knew I wanted to get there, but when I got there, I wondered where there was. <laughs> and it's a bit like Margaret Guilfoyle, the accountant who becomes, you know, chief financial person in the Liberal Party, and then suddenly wasn't, but they weren't enough. And we, what we now know, if there's one learning, critical mass is important. So what you're saying is that, you know, there weren't many. There were fewer women then, but they were probably stronger in their influence. But the women in the Morrison government, they, well, they weren't treated with respect. And if they said so, they're suffering from Stockhausen syndrome. Well, they were kind of almost there on sufferance, really, and they were sort of enablers of, unfortunately, of, of their behaviour and, and unfortunately, used as human called shields. crumb maidens. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, one of my favourite and most educational things I've, I've watched in the last year has been was misrepresented. Oh, yeah. um, that fantastic series. Anyone, if you haven't seen it, go and watch it because Margaret Guilfoyle's in there, and there's yeah. there's a whole lot of brilliant women um, of that era, and you just think, God, you had to be strong to stand up in that environment. And, and I have to say, Beryl Beau Repair is like a character... Sorry, Dame yeah, Beryl yeah. Beau Repair is an incredible character in your book. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask you more about her because the, the image of her taking the Prime Minister to task... Oh, it's and glorious. <laughs> ..was one of my favourite images in the book. Um, but, but that idea that uh, you were brought in as part of the, the National uh, Women's Advisory Council uh, to sort of fix... The, the women problem that the government had or to, to be that voice uh, that was lacking. Uh, what was... What did you... What was the first thing you did in there? Because you talk about running through the halls of old Parliament House and, and causing... Well, that came a little bit later. <laughs> <laughs> causing chaos. But... Well, it, it, at the end of the, um, the Whitlam government, there was a, com a commitment to the Royal Commission on Human Relationships. And the recommendations were pretty clear. <coughs> and the Fraser government promised to implement some of those. And Malcolm Fraser kept that, and a part of it was to look at um, the position of women and discrimination against women and look at l consequences that might come. And so I joined that group of 12 women. And there were two things about it that were remarkable. The liberal way of doing advisers is people come there in their own right. They don't have to answer to the group they came from. A Labor Party um, council which replaced that meant that if you came from the Union of Teachers, you, before you could agree to anything, you had to go back and get permission from your base. Well, and, and that remains a very interesting thing about doing business because it's much easier under the Liberal way if they have 12 people giving them advice whose credentials they respect um, you're more likely to get fairly speedy things. So, Malcolm Barrowbar Repair, when we got to Canberra, and um, I knew one of the people on that, a couple of the women there, um, but Quentin Bryce was there and Jan Marsh and so on, but we were all from, you know, we were, we were all in our 30s and I think 40s, early 40s. And Beryl had a reception and then told us the rules, the party rules, like no drinking. Um, <laughs> in the motel at night, which, of course, is what we would immediately have done in front of television because we couldn't do it when we were home. But essentially, she gave us a serious piece of advice. She said, always go to the top. You've got three years here. You need to make them work. Don't waste time. You go to the top, you get to know them. You need to know how the system works in Parliament and you need to know how to get... get go to those ministers and tell them what you want to know. They know nothing. Yep. So... We did, and that's how we'd be roaming around the corridors of Parliament House, you know, way past our normal bedtimes at 10 o'clock at night. And it did feel like a big boys' boarding school. And we'd intercept them on the way and say, you want to talk about this? And they'd say, what's that? And we'd say, come on. Anyway, we, we did. And I still have relationships with those men like Fred Cheney. You know, we're talking to each other with the Teals this time, you know, and that's like 40 years ago, 45 years ago. But I think that... I, and I, they knew they had to have someone... And I asked Bob Ellicott this years and years later, I said, but how did I get on that list? Because I just got a phone call when I was in Broken Hill um, to say, uh, would you like to go on the National Women's Advisory Council? And I said, what's that? And he said, oh, you know, it's going to be something to advise the Prime Minister on Women's Affairs. And I said, oh, it sounds good. 
Um, and he said, right, you know, you'll hear from me. Well, a couple of weeks went by, but I was, you know, um, working with doctors and nurses on sex education in Broken Hill and it seemed a long way away. Anyway, it happened. And I said, what? And he said, we had to have someone from the women's electoral lobby on there. Now, that's always an interesting thing in itself because having been sort of booed out of town and shouted at and so on in certain areas, well, you know, they could barely say it, um, or, and family planning. So I was the person who had both those headlines and that's, that's what he told me is how we got there. And he said then that when they created that council that Malcolm Fraser was determined it was going to work and, and it would be better than if it had been done under Whitlam. I didn't know that at the time. So Beryl get, calls the Prime Minister and she says, you know, we need to have a meeting of the council, you need to meet the council. And said, so we're there. And this was about three months after we'd formed. And he's talking and he said, oh, well, I have to tell you that um, the um, motion to get um, abortion off the um, medical benefits is coming up in March. And she said, when? And he said, the other day. And she said, that's International Women's Day. She said, Malcolm, that's not going to happen. Like, we're sitting there like schoolgirls going, it's a prime minister? <laughs> She's talking to him like that? She's telling him not to? She's like standing there saying, Malcolm, that is simply not going to happen. You can't do that on International Women's Day. So I want you to put it off for at least two months. And he goes, yes, Beryl, OK. <laughs> so anyway, he left and she said, right, you've got two months. <laughs> off you go. See you later. And the people kept saying, oh, they won't let them talk about that, you know. They're, they're, well, we were talking to everyone around Australia and we just turned that bill around. And there's nothing like success to help you with the confidence to keep challenging the status quo when you think it's unfair, unjust, and in some cases, for women having backyard terminations and so on, unsafe. And it's not respectful. So... Meeting people like that was very good and her, you always felt confident when she had your back that you could, you know, almost do anything. And that's made a very big impression on me about making sure that women, especially young women, know I have their back. And I want them to know that that's what older women need to do. We need to support younger women to find their voices. And you just look at some of them now, it's so astonishingly wonderful to see women being able to defend themselves, articulate who they are, work together and I'm just a very great supporter and I'm glad I'm part of their audience at the moment. I, I want to come back and talk to you about family planning and, and the abortion, you know, the, the long campaign for abortion reform, which is not over, of course, um, because access is, is another ongoing issue. But let's go back and talk about well for a moment because, you know, over the last few months, kitchen table conversations have become... Uh, you know, quite powerful politically, you know. Everyone uh, has been uh, really inspired by the Kathy McGowan model of kitchen table conversations, the Voices Off movement. But there were some other really powerful kitchen tables um, in Australian history, and Well is one of those. Uh, the Women's Electoral Lobby was born as a kitchen table conversation with just a handful of people around, uh, I think, a table in Double Bay and then, then your kitchen table in McMahon's Point. Tell, tell us about how you go from that intimate, you know, couple of people around a table talking about what could be to a political movement that has that impact and that makes change on a massive scale like, like Well has been able to do. Sometimes when I think back on it, it seems remarkable that it happened. But it essentially happened like this. It happened with the auspicing of abortion law reform <clears throat> and an idea that a woman had in Victoria, Beatrice Faust, copied by something that was done in the US, which was questioning in New York magazine the attitudes of the people towards women and what, where they saw women in society um, before the, the American election of 1970, 72. Um, and she, through abortion law reform, which was just revving up at that time for, you know, for about the fourth iteration of it, came to Sydney and asked some people. There were only 12 people there. And I always think about Margaret Mead saying, you know, you only need a dozen people to start a movement and, you know, you've got a Christian um, model to defend yourself with that. And 
we sat there and she talked about what, what do you think people really think about where women are? Are there such things as women's issues? Um, are they men's issues? Are they political issues at all? Anyway, the questionnaire was devised, largely copied and edited. And that gave us a piece of paper and a task. And there's nothing a teacher, and we're nearly all teachers, likes better than a bit of a lesson plan. <laughs> there it was, you know, a lesson plan and a shopping list. <laughs> so we got the shopping list and we got the lesson plan and we went and we asked all these people, we got to 150 electorates to ask men what they thought about women's issues. And there were some extraordinary results. But that got those answers and that activity and the questioning gave us the energy, the purpose and the connectiveness to be able to pursue that. And it's never, ever gone back from that. The World Scorecard this time was a magnificent piece of work for this election. And five groups had a scorecard and the idea was always to put a scorecard so in my electorate the member was John Kramer which was Ben along and his answer to the question was um, what's a woman's most perfect attribute for political life he said virginity <laughs> virginity like we're sitting there thinking god our residual value has gone down a long way <laughs> My God. <laughs> and I thought, I actually t had one of his daughters in my classroom at the time, and I thought, how could he say something like that in 1972? What was he thinking? Well, he wasn't thinking. And you see, it, it, it was, it, but it, the thing about it, because it, you, you don't get the same response now because they're more rehearsed. <laughs> People know what questions to expect. But you, and they won't be questioned. This time, very few people were prepared to be questioned. So it had to go on their statements. But it did put you into a position of thinking, OK, we need to change that. We need to change that so we're treated seriously. We need to be able to use our voice and our vote in a particular way and they need to know that women power is here. And there is no doubt that women were a strong force in that Whitlam election as they were, I think, this time. And for not dissimilar reasons. I mean, the treatment of Brittany Higgins and Grace Tame and the whole situation, the sort of trivialisation of what's of political of behaviour in Parliament and putting the Kate Jenkins report back, you know, and saying, yes, we're going to do it, but we just haven't got around to it now. We tr we'll try later, you know, it'll happen, but not now. I think, you know, and going on those marches, everyone just saying, look, we don't even want to talk about it anymore, just enough's enough, just go away, go away. And sort of that's what they did. <laughs> Oh, they did go away. Um, uh, um, it's hard not to jump all over the place because there's so much in this book, Wendy. But, you know, when you, you were talking about the survey uh, and, and that response, which is phenomenal, uh, wow. Uh, I'm reminded of the work that you did in the 90s in the corporate sector. And you made the uh, executives of Citibank, I think, take a bit of a survey as well. And... And the results were kind of, they were, they were kind of stagger, equally staggering. Well, they were right? scary. But, uh, but look, I'm still my mother's daughter. I was raised not to be bold, not to draw attention to myself and wait until I was asked to dance. Citibank asked me to oh, come and have a look at them. <laughs> and I said, what does that mean? And they said, well, maybe you could do a cultural map for us. And I said, I could do that. I had no idea what they're talking about. But I thought, yeah, I can do that. And that's my other piece of advice, really, to young women to say yes first and think about it later. If someone thinks you can do it, you can do it. You don't have to do a PhD while the bloke beside you takes the job and then it gets the next three. You're still doing the PhD to see if you could take the one that you've just lost. So I found it staggering. We did a, a survey, a written survey, and we did in, I did the interviews. But the written survey had nothing to do with. We agreed we'd make, make it like a blind trust. So I got some pretty amazing responses in some of them, but the best ones were in the written survey where they were able to be anonymous. And a third of the people in Citibank said that no woman should really go back to work after she'd had a baby because her brains were basically scrambled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> they used that phrase. But this is in 1996. Uh, 1996. But this is a not that long ago. Yeah. And, and, and another one was 
um, it's really hard for the team to do without a woman when she goes on maternity leave. It's just simply not a good idea. It's best really to finish the career then. And so I brought these up, of course, in the deep brief. And I said, so what about people who play cricket for Australia? <laughs> what did they do? And what do you think they did in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s? They went on boat trips to England. It took six weeks to get there. They played cricket for six months. Yeah, they were guaranteed a job. Is that more doing for Australia than having a baby? Let's get it. And they go, well, having a baby is a personal thing. Is playing cricket not a personal thing? <laughs> Come on. But it's just that capacity not to see it in a way that lines it up against existing behaviour, which I'm not hostile to. I love cricket. Love having babies. <laughs> but they have to have a value that is reasonable in terms of the life of the parent or the person playing and the organisation. And, and the CEO of Citigroup at the time said to me, you know, he said, I've come from, he was an Irish-American and, or an American-Irishman, no, an Irish-American man, and he said, I've come from Taiwan, he said, and I had a direct reporting group of 13. And he said there were something like nine different nationalities and there were seven women and six men. He said, I've pretty well here got the Sydney University economics football team. <laughs> and he said, it's not good enough. They're not diverse enough. Diverse, diversity is strength in, in business. So anyway, we stayed there quite a while. So I'm still friends with Citibank. Plenty of work to do, <laughs> clearly, on the culture there. But I mean, I, I raise that because, you know, it's not ancient history by any stretch. This is not something that happened 60 years ago or 50 years ago. That culture, that mindset that excludes women and keeps us out yeah. is still there. There's an undercurrent of it. Um, and, and, you know, going back to that Kate, uh, uh, Kate Jennings uh, speech, uh, that, that idea that women's issues are not central to the revolution continues. And we're at this inflection point, I think, at the moment with the election that we've just had, where it's possible that the women's issues, so caring for children, caring for older people, making sure we have bod everyone has bodily autonomy and, and their rights respected, that's got to be a part of the in my view, the pathway out of this stagnation that we're in. Um, and you've done some incredible work on in, in this area in, in the past, Wendy, and I'm particularly interested in your work with Good Start um, and, and the way that you took a for-profit, a failing for-profit institution you know, like ABC Learning and turned it into a, a thriving um, and for-purpose institution in Good Start. Not for profit. Not for profit. And into for a not-for-profit. For-purpose. For -purpose. Yeah. Um, and, and so, uh, so tell us, can you tell us a bit about that journey and what can we take from that about the kind of childcare and the kind of elder care and the kind of care economy we need to build in the future? Uh, a lot of this starts with the election of the Howard government and because John Howard, who was actually my local member for 17 years and he... He really put um, aged care and early learning childcare into the money market. And that's how Eddie Groves, the milkman, managed to get an empire of childcare centres here and in America and in Singapore because the, mar the government made the mar this marketing arrangement. It's the same with aged care. We, wouldn't, we, we had different aged care before the market took over. So a group of people, and I was not in that first group of thinking about it, although I had been debating Eddie Groves a few times on um, television because I disapproved so strongly of, what he, of, of the quality of the care as much as the methodology. And one of the, the person who was most worked up was a man called Robin Crawford, supported by someone called Michael Trail. And they'd both been Macquarie bankers and they were interested in the equity issues and the size of it, but they were also interested, they were good men who were interested in what it meant to be have the market take over early learning. At that time it was always called childcare. And I have to say, <laughs> from my point of view, 
the education, of the, the years between naught and five are about the children. They are not about working mothers. It is not a working mother's issue. It is a working mother's issue, but the child has to be central to what is being offered to that child from naught to five. And if that child doesn't get a decent offer, we are really stuffed as a nation because the children are so far behind, they will never catch up. So these guys sort of worked in that and they thought, but they did see it also as a Macquarie Bank equity sort of op opportunity. And so they came to me and said, we don't know much about childcare, but we know that you know quite a bit about it and would you like to join us? And so they borrowed money, they found five investment angels whom they'd met in their banking days and so we want you to invest in this interest free for five or 10 or whatever number of years. Some were five, some were seven and some were 10. And then they went to the government and said, we've got 25 million, we want you to match that and um, it can be a loan or it can be an investment and we want, that's, this is what we want to do. And the government agreed to that. So, and he was going bankrupt and into administration. And uh, so we took over the, so there were 770, I think there were 880 first and then 770 centres. And it was a remarkable, it was, it was run a bit like a sort of Howard Johnson motel franchise. You know, you could only buy your cars a certain colour they came out of, um, you know, Brisbane. They had to come out of a Brisbane workshop where clearly he had financial interests. Everything and everyone in, in the place wore the same thing. And it was um, it, it, the oh, antithesis McDonald's. of creative childcare, yeah. you know. Yeah. And here was this big move. So that's what happened. And we realised very quickly, I think, well, within two years, which is maybe not as quick as it, it should be, that might be more in retrospect, that we had to change the quality of the care in order to stay in this sector. And so we supported accreditation of childcare centres and we worked really hard. We hired probably one of the best chief executives I've ever seen, Julia Davison. And we worked hard on being the go-to place for quality childcare. So I've left Good Start now, although I am on a board which is about for purpose um, not-for-profit investment partners and so I'm looking still at that area and I'm most interested, you know, p personal interest again, aged care, um, <coughs> because I can see that it's a similar kind of opportunity to do that because whatever we've got now isn't working and the market can't fix it and the government can't fix it but there is this space in the centre. We always come back to the centre in, in life in good decision making really I think so this can be too left, it can be too right, but somewhere in the middle is a place where we can have good childcare. The great bit of learning from Good Start is the best investment is in the most vulnerable people. The greatest returns come from investing and learning from the most vulnerable and the most disadvantaged. And to think that you can fix it by going to the top of the system is just nonsense. From my point of view, I think it should all be done by the state, not to five. I don't, I just, I mean, why do we separate school and learning? You go to Finland or Denmark or s Germany, you, you know, the, sc the school, the learning place is the centre of the community. So you have the high school, primary school, preschool, old person's learning institute, whatever, and we know that life is about learning because learning is at the centre of the community. And that's why I love teachers. Mm. It's interesting, I, I, I wrote about, oh, I think they want to clap for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote about ABC Learning in my book because it is such a cautionary tale of what not to do. Absolutely. And, and, you know, my whole career before, before I was elected was in the creative sector and the creative industries and in culture. And I always, thought of my career as being about moving Australia from the extraction to the creative yes. economy. And now, since writing my book, I think it's about moving Australia to the creative and the caring economy. Because care is the other thing, apart, you know, creativity. Well, care's creative. Exactly, it is. And it's, it's essentially human to take care of each other and to take care of the planet. That's what makes us human, what brings us together. 
Um, and, uh, and I agree, I think we obviously really radically need to reform childcare and aged care. Um, but, but I think there are some interesting models that are uh, not state-owned but more uh, locally distributed like cooperatives and, and um, part more participatory forms. I think it should be... It should be not for profit. It should 100%. It should be not be not for profit. And it's quite interesting in, in that um, I've met a couple of places since I've written the book. Uh, and I, I've met a couple of communities where women have moved to um, out of Canberra. And because I know some of the areas around there. And one of them, they were telling me, some women in Cabago, that are famous for not shaking Morrison's hand. And, <laughs> Um, not them, but their, their friends, that what was interesting for them, they moved out of Canberra because they wanted a community life that was different. And they'd all had associations with this part of New South Wales. And there were three or four of them and they're all in the University of the Third Age and they, they're a very strong community group. But there's no aged care. And now they realise they cannot afford to go back to Canberra. They can't afford the models of care there. And unless they have some sort of local way of dealing with this, they're in trouble. Yeah. And they've been my sort of go-to group to, to think about it because in the models that we're looking at, where we, we, we have been in this group, I'm on this board, been buying some models of care um, that already exist and trying to ameliorate them, and, and particularly in the disability sector and the aged care sector. And I can, and the world always comes back to the local community, that you have your care models in the same way as you have your educational models, you have them in the local community. Because I remember when there we had nurses' homes and nurses' training and you knew everyone. We had teachers, ed, teacher housing, we had police housing. You think of all those places that no longer, they just, where did they all go? You know, those are like little phantoms that sort of, slipped across the landscape before we were looking and we lost it all. Yeah. Nobody, nobody talked about it. No. And you can't have a functioning society if your nurses and aged care workers and, you know, uh, teachers can't afford to live in the places where they have to work either. So it is all really connected. Um, and, and I think looking at alternative models, there's a really great um, care cooperative disability care and aged care cooperative that I write about in my book as well. It's got to be local. It's got to be worker-owned and taking care of the people yeah. doing the work as well. Oh, but you talked, I mean, there's so much for us to talk about and we're running quickly out of time and I want to come to your questions very soon too. So please uh, let us know. We'll, we'll be coming to you in a few minutes with questions. But I want to talk, you, you talked about being a teacher and one of the things I love in the book is that you say that you still think of yourself as a teacher. And I, I've encountered a lot of teachers in politics, like Clover, who's yeah. my mentor. And um, what, what is the superpower of being a teacher in being an activist and being a director and in all the things you do? I've thought a lot about this. It was a, it was a big heartbreak for me not to have a teaching career. I, and in my little dream cupboard, where dreams sit that are not going to be realised, some of them have been along the way, but there's always, you know, the thought that I might have been a principal of a girls' school. Well, it's not going to happen now, but, you know, it still just sort of sits in there and you think about what kind of a person you might have been if you are a principal of a girls' school. But... I think the power of teachers, especially if you've had a good education before you get into the classroom, is that you have to research. Mm. You have to know your subject. You have to be able to synthesise. You have to be able to make it creative and engaging so you can't go to bed every night at one o'clock in the morning and get up and teach at seven, or, you know, leave home at seven. You've got to have enough emotional energy to engage the people who are in the classroom. And in secondary schools in my day, you could have done, you ha could have had seven different classes a day, from age 11 to 17. So your audience is constantly changing, and facts are changing, information's changing, ways of putting it together are changing. So you have to learn to move with that. And my experience in the boardroom of for-profits, big corporations, not-for-profits, is that is the most indispensable skill. 
There are guys but I sit beside in a class action company I worked at, which is probably some of the smartest people. I think they were all probably actuaries as well as lawyers. There was no number or figure or something that they couldn't be on top of in five minutes. But for the most part, they couldn't ever engage anybody in what, the, how the idea might be progressed or in some sense of joint ownership. They could only give you the hard-edged information. And that's not how people change and flourish. And it doesn't mean... What I learnt in many, on many boards is that I didn't have to sit and panic about not knowing something about financial institutions in order to be there. It was enough to be there to be some of the engagement glue of getting a team to work because really board of directors, good board of directors is a team. And so... And I think, you know, I, I taught speed reading my first year of teaching when they were, it was the first year of the Wyndham Report, I'm so old. And I remember as I was teaching, I think, I'm learning this because good teachers learn every day. And the capacity for lifelong learning is somehow implanted in a teacher. It's a very rare teacher who doesn't, who doesn't have a great sense of curiosity. And curiosity can get you into trouble but can take you a long way. I, I think, you know, staying with that, even though you weren't a teacher, you did still, you know, in the words of your grandson Elias, you took care of all the children in the world, um, which is my favourite testimonial in your book. Like, all, There's a lot of fancy people giving you testimonials, but Elias, I think, nailed it. Um, oh, he said I was a street worker. <laughs> <laughs> what does that <laughs> his teacher said, what did that and she said well you know she marches on the street to get things done <laughs> <laughs> alright well let's go back to that bit then marching on the street to get things done um, before I come to audience questions and I have a, a few last questions but but Let's talk about that big battle that, that has been a through line in your career, which is the fight for body autonomy for women, the fight for abortion rights and for family, the, the ability to control your fertility. Um, and, and the way that the Family Planning Association managed to, to, to be the starting point for so much <coughs> political change in Australia. And yet it took until, what was it, 2019? 2019, 50 years. 2019 for, for abortion to be decriminalised in New South Wales. And now you look at what's happening in America and well, it chills. It, I, I've had a couple of invitations to go and do the fight in America and I keep thinking to myself, well, where would I start? You know, all those states, I don't know. But anyway, it's terrifying. But, you know, Susan Rahm is a really good friend of mine and... She always found it strange I wouldn't join the Labor Party. And, you know, my name was Ryan before. She kept hers. I didn't. And uh, she, there were two things against me. It was somewhat assuaged by the fact that my husband had a birthday on St Patrick's Day. But uh, <laughs> this is close. But she used to say, well, we used to say to each other, round about the time we turned 75, our mantra would be, she, I said, you can own it and I'll, and I'll join it. Just keep going. Just keep going. And when we saw what was happening in the US, or well not Susan, because abortion wasn't her thing, she was still a Catholic schoolgirl, um, she, a, a group of us who'd worked on, in the women's electoral lobby, started the women's electoral lobby, uh, we'd auspiced by that abortion law reform group, we decided we should take a very hard look at America, and that was in 2017 and say, just after the Trump election, really, and say, this is coming to us. You know, there's a sort of saying that if it happens in America, it happens here three years later. And we needed to think about it. So I... So we had a group and about seven or eight of us met and we said, what are we going to do? And we decided on a strategy. We're older and wiser now. We can think strategically and we, we can work that stuff out. And most of us have had, you know, reasonably interesting political jobs. And we said, what we'll do is we'll prepare to get abortion off the criminal code. What we realised, that abortions were accessible under the medical benefits scheme and they were accessible 
um, with advice from family planning clinics or GPs. But the fact was they were still on the criminal code. And most young women didn't know that. They said, what are you carrying on about? You know, it's okay, anyone can go. And my friend had one last week. And I go, no. And then someone was actually charged. And of course, it will be no surprise to you to know it was a poor woman with five children or four children already. And we thought, this is not where we're going. So we just got very strategic. We wrote to um, the Premier and the um, Leader of the Opposition in New South Wales and said, we're going to pull this campaign on. It was happening in Queensland at that time. And we're going to, we're going to start a campaign. We're not going to do it as part of the election campaign. But it's straight on. Day after election, whoever's Premier, we want to meet you and talk and say, what are we going to do? So the Gladys Berejiklian was Premier and I went to see... I, I wrote, wrote immediately to her and to Brad Hazard and said, I want to come and talk to you about termination of pregnancy and getting it off the code, criminal code. So about 12 weeks after the election, I went and spoke to Brad Hazard and he said, it's fine, it's going to happen. Um, and it's quite curious now because he said, we've got a methodology to do it. We'll deal with Parliament House. If you can bring the community, we should be able to do it. And I said... This is a big ask. He said, he said, trust me. And I said, big ask to trust a Liberal politician. <laughs> My experience, although there have been some good ones, I've, I would trust. Anyway, we had a bit of a laugh about that and he said that. And of course, what was interesting is that Alex Greenwich led that and he's an independent. What did he just lead? Voluntary assisted dying. Who says independents can't do this stuff? Woohoo! Anyway, I, so he said, right, and I said, well, I probably won't talk to you again until it's over, and he said, we probably take about three months, six months to do it. Well, it took a bit longer, but they never, ever, they kept their word, they never reneged, and it was, they were beaten up in a way, those, the politicians who supported it, and at that stage, it was the biggest cross-section of politicians who'd ever supported something. I mean, and they were in step with the Australian population. But I sat for nearly 30 hours listening to that debate and in Parliament and, and parts of it were very menacing and very scary. But in the end, abortion has become a, matter, a health matter between a woman and her doctor and all that, we're, un, we're always vulnerable in these matters because they are deep matters to people. Mm. But it won't be... It would be very hard, uh, it, it's almost impossible to think it could ever go back on a criminal code, but you can never say never. But I can't think, you know, how you would shift a number that is between 75 and 80 and has been since 1978, 78, when, uh, 83, when the National Women's Advisory Council got Ida Butrose to run a questionnaire through the Women's Weekly. And that number's never shifted. It should be a matter between a woman and her doctor. And so I think that we're probably reasonably safe. But what we're finding is there's a different issue. It's about accessibility. That's right. And people still are crossing the borders to get it in places where it's easier. And so it doesn't really go away, but you won't go to, you won't go to prison for 10 years and nor will the person who provides it. You're, it'll be, it's, it's a different story now. That's right. And, I mean, there are always ways for the forces of uh, holding women back um, and, and cutting, cutting back on access, and the fact that it isn't available in a lot of public hospitals is another ongoing challenge. And I remember at the launch of Choice Words, uh, you know, a book um, that I contributed to for when, when the campaign was on, uh, the, the woman from... Uh, from Tasmania, who, who got fired from Cricket Tasmania, yes, remember? Yes. She had to come to the mainland to, to get a termination. And um, and so access particularly... Right, Hill goes to Canberra. right. So, so, you know, access in regional communities is, is an ongoing issue. But, oh, Wendy, there's so many more questions here, but I want to hear some of the questions from the audience. Does anyone have a question here in the room? And if you do, please raise your hand and I think we'll get either a mic to you or... Yes. Any questions? Oh, down the front here. Thank you. Do you like my microphone? Oh, you've got one of your own. <laughs> this morning we heard Van Badham talking about uh, QAnon and on. About, uh, about QAnon. QAnon. 
the conspiracy theories and, and actually how she got threats on the internet because she was investigating QAnon of rape. And that seems to be a dominant discourse now that women are being threatened with rape because they're coming up with opinions or views or investigating things that men don't want them to. Why is it that after all these years of women's liberation, we're now getting this backlash of men who literally threatening to rape women because they don't like their views? What can we do about it? I think there are probably quite a few answers to that, and, and there's no one single answer that will help. But rape has been a reward for men in war. Just go back to reading Helen of Troy and, you know, and, and all that. It's been an entitlement. And somewhere deep in our inner consciousness, we are still influenced by things in our life. You know, we have to learn to correct some of the things we do. The capacity to be able to threaten women online is, you know, a new version of being, of trying to sexually intimidate, to use violence and terror as a threat for their seemingly aberrant behaviour. And somewhere in that, we have to learn as women, we're not available for that exploitation. We need to know how to flick the off button. We need to know how to not let, not to give consent to being victims. And I know that's easier said than done, but even in, in I wrote the Cleo sex column for 10 years, you know, which shocks people sometimes, that, especially my children who think I don't even know what sex means. But <laughs> they, I think that what I learned there from the questions was how easily women become victims in order to get approval of varying kinds. And it's only since I was writing this book that I learnt how I was re really have been a victim in an individual sense. I might have been a victim of a system, but I don't take that personally. That's political. Since I was a young girl of 12 and my father had a big problem with alcohol, and I used to, and I stayed in this little hostel in Forbes where I went to Forbes High School. And I was always worried, and my mother would always let me know if my father was driving into the town that day, which was home was 18 miles away, just in case he was drunk. And somewhere where I'd seen, there weren't many streets in Forbes. If you went out to, have, you know, there were only two cafes, and you could go and have a milkshake two afternoons a week, and that was your outing. And this boy said to me, well, anyway, we went out, and as far as I knew, my father wasn't there, and, and this boy said to me, um, anyway, your father's a drunk. And I said, so? <laughs> he couldn't say anything. <laughs> and I've learned to say so. So you're a slut? So? <laughs> I'm not going to be shamed or own words that people put on to me. I mean, I've been insulted in Parliament. I've been insulted on radio and television. I've had my name across... You know, it hasn't all been singing and dancing. I had my name across the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald. McCarthy double dips. I woke up to that and my phone's ringing and thinking, what's everyone ringing me for at 7 o'clock in the morning? And I picked up the first one. They said, you're in real trouble. Yeah. I go, what do you mean? Anyway, I went and got my Sydney Morning Herald. And there was a story saying I was being paid for two jobs. Imagine that, doing two jobs and being paid for both. <laughs> Seriously? So, and because they were both government jobs, one was to be the deputy chair of the ABC, which paid $10,000, because it was a you know, little part-time thing. Ha, 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 yes. <laughs> and the other one was to be a worker being paid $60,000 at the vice Tenant authority as general manager. And... I looked at it, no, so I rang up the Minister of Communications, I said, where did this stuff come from? And he said, not really sure, but I think it would be Richardson. He doesn't like it much. And I said, well, I don't care, you know, just doing my job. Anyway, he said, look, the boss thinks, no, he said, actually, the silver bodgy hawk <laughs> thinks that you should make a decision to choose one or the other. And I said, I'm not going to do that. And he said, well, you might have to. And I said, OK, well, I'll take the ABC. So he said, you'll take the ABC for $10,000 a year. 
not 60,000 or whatever I got paid at the Bicentennial Authority. And I said, yes. Why is that? And I said, because it's more important. He said, I don't think you'll like that answer very much. And I said, I don't care. <laughs> like, I'm not available to... I'm not good at, you know, doing other things, but I'm not available to be shamed or to own the words that other people put on me if I think they're unfair. Anyway, so next thing he rings back and he says, well, it, you might as well stay with both of them, he said, because you're the only one who knows anything that's going on at the Bicentennial Authority and <laughs> they're all being fired every day. He said, so you might as well stay there and just do the ABC job. And he said, and I said, you might, you might actually point out to him we had Attorney General, Solicitor General, Private Solicitor, Bicentennial, there four legal opinions about having two forms of income. And I said, and I didn't want to start a campaign on how many of you guys have two forms of income. <laughs> Story done, you know. And so that's, that was the, that's the version of trolling then, you know. And, I mean, about your own personal life, well, you really do just... You cannot let people own you like that. And I, it, it, but it's a tough lesson. But if we can do that, we'll increase. It's like Chanel Constance's work on you know, coercive control. If you let it run away from you, you are already the victim. And it's not good for either young men or young women to learn that at an early stage in their lives. I think um, we had some questions. Uh, more questions? Well, sorry, that was a very long answer, I'm sorry. Well, this might have to be our last question. Oh, I'm so glad you got to all of those things, though, Wendy. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um, the question that I want to ask is about uh, accountability and responsibility, taking into account that, that we know pretty much anything that we want to know when it comes to government policy and, and uh, vested interests and all of that sort of stuff. Sorry, and sir. Um, vested interest yes. in policy making, those sorts of things, can, um, lobbying. We know we know all of that sort of stuff because we can Google. Um, and yet, um, there w uh, there will be news item after news item and in investigation and royal commissions. And to a very large extent, no heads will roll ever, really. And I'm wondering, from a strategic perspective, and your very long history in this you know, how that can be changed, because it must be able to be changed, surely. So how do we get accountability back in politics? Well, I think if we can't get it back, we got, we got it back when Whitlam came in, because, we, I mean, democracy flourishes if it changes at least every decade. And it's not healthy for anybody to be there much longer than a decade. We've probably got good opportunities now to change it. But the idea that you send everything off to a Royal Commission, which means that you can forget about it for three years and pretend as though it's not happening and then just maybe pick it up, oh, my God, we're having an election, we can't do anything now, so we'll just keep on doing it. I guess that that has to be a consumer-led revolt. I mean, if I was Linnell Briggs having done that Royal Commission of Inquiry, I would just want to shoot myself because... It, very little has changed. And it was a very, very clear and coherent set of recommendations. I think... I actually think that the independents, who are all shiny new and not jaded and troubled by other parties, will probably shine a lot of light on these matters. Um, and they're... They're to a person. They're very interesting clever young women and, <coughs> excuse me, and, and, and I, don't, I don't think there's probably anyone there much more than 50, um, maybe 55, who's coming in, and they're going to start asking some questions. And, and I, think, I think we've probably come to the end of the line to deferral. It's not a good way to handle things, and I suspect there'll be a lot of enthusiasm the Albanese government will want to start... It already is framing its time in, in terms of two terms, and that probably makes sense, which is the beginning of saying this is how long it takes to create the sort of world we might have. And, of course, the other thing, that we've outsourced the public service. The fact is, you know, the, the, a good public service with no fear or favour about giving advice is a much stronger democratic process and structure 
than the chartered accountant firms who are now the biggest income earners on giving corporate advice to public sector. I mean, I just think, you know, my husband worked for Coopers as it was and PricewaterhouseCoopers and so on as it is now all around the world and it was a really superior accounting firm and it did surveys and investigations. But now if you want advice on health, you don't ring the Commonwealth Health Department because you know that nobody's left there. You ring the person who worked for the Commonwealth Health Department six months ago and who now works for one of the big firms and you pay twice as much for the advice, which is already six months out of date in terms of the inner circle and you think you're getting a good deal and you don't take that notice advice anyway, you just pay for it. You know, it's, it's crazy. So we have to get back that lovely balance, which is a fine balance between judiciary, legislature and try and make sense of how we manage a country in a democratic way to do the best for its citizens. And I guess that it sounds lofty, but it should be normal practice. And where, whose advice you take becomes a very important part of it. Well, I hope this the new wave, the teal wave, is going to put accountability and transparency and integrity back into government. And ICAC will help. And, and that yeah. federal ICAC is going to really help and be very entertaining. As you have been, Wendy McCarthy, thank you so much for this wonderful <laughs> conversation.